Hey there, uh, welcome to Wandering DMs. I am Dan. Uh, Paul couldn't be with us this week. We, he will be back next week. In his place, we have a very special treat here. We managed to get back Brooklyn-based artist Isabel Garbani back on. And way back in season one of Wandering DMs, we had a really great show with Isabel on Art of D&D, &D, Volume 1, the 70s. And you can go back and look at that in your leisure. But today we got her back. We taped this a couple days ago. Um, so we'll be running the, uh, the tape for in a minute or two. Uh, we'll get Isabel back to talk about um, Art of D&D Volume 2, the 80s. And once again, the conceit is that Isabel, uh, with her training as a, uh, a Master of Fine Arts and her professional existence as an artist, will be seeing famous D&D &D works for the very first time. Uh, uh, on the show and meanwhile I of course will have been seeing them about 10,000 times or more um, and we'll get our, our different viewpoints there so you'll see some you know uh, famous pieces maybe some of them are your favorites and we'll as usual there might be some controversy here and we'll see um, what what your take is uh, at the end of this uh, you know one thing I should say is that we were using the uh, 2018 work Art and Arcana by Wizards of the Coast, which is a really great resource, and actually Paul Siegel gifted us with this particular volume. Um, and I hand this to Isabel. I guess I'm kind of repeating stuff you're going to see in the pre-tape uh, segment. But of course, that work is by Michael Whitwer, Kyle Newman, Sam Winter, and a really good friend of the show, John Peterson. And as usual, anything that's got John's thumb in it is just really great work, a bunch of stuff that I never knew before they compiled them in that particular uh, volume. Uh, so when I run the pre-taped segment, uh, I'll be live in the chat here on YouTube and Twitch uh, to see what your reaction is. I'll be looking forward to that. And before I start that, i got to say one other thing. Overnight here on the Wandering DMs channel on YouTube, we did pass over 1,000 subscribers for the first time, which we have been looking forward to for, for some time, as a matter of fact. So uh, particularly today, we have to give a really warm thanks to all of our viewers for supporting the show and telling other people about the show and uh, you know, continue to tell people that you think might be interested in our content as we continue to grow at the network. Uh, we have a whole bunch of great D&D authors and artists and creators, both old and new, who are scheduled to be on the show in upcoming months. And we think that you will continue to be excited uh, as much as we are to get an opportunity to talk about them here on the Wandering DMs channel. Um, okay, so enough about that. Let's go on and see what uh, Isabel Garbani had to say about famous D&D works in the 80s. I'll be back at the end. Uh, so uh, I am here with Isabel Garbani, um, Brooklyn-based fine artist who is... Uh, Re-invited. Yes, uh, you were disinvited for a while. Um, for those of you who are maybe new viewers, we did uh, uh, D Art in D&D Volume 1 back in Season 1 of Wandering Beyond. Wow. Yeah, that was like two years ago. Oh my God. Actually, yeah. So in that uh, first volume, um, we covered uh, up to basically the 70s, up to the first edition AD&D hardcover books mm -hmm. is what we looked at. And there was some contention. Some contention, which is why I was disinvited. But I redeemed myself. Quite. So you have been reinvited. I've been reinvited. And uh, so in the in the interim, you only occasionally showed up on this show and every Saturday night for the Book of War War game. That's right. Um, so we're happy to have you back. Thank you. And we'll see um, how long it lasts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but to complete your bio, uh, Isabel does have a Master of Fine Arts from uh, New York Academy of Art. Those are my street cr street creds. <laughs> and yeah. your street creds, of course, are that you. <laughs> Uh, you paint, and you're a sculptor, and you work in plastics and mixed yep. media and food now. And food now. And you have had exhibitions and displays around the world. That's right. Including Taiwan and... Um, Tunisia. Tunisia and... Slovakia. Uh, Slovakia and all kinds of other places I'm probably forgetting, as well as New York City and around the U.S. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for spending time with us here on Wandering the You're welcome. My pleasure. And of course, the idea, the conceit here on the Art and D&D shows is that you're going to get a contrast in reactions between Isabel, who is seeing some famous D&D art for the first time in the last 24 hours, <laughs> versus me, versus Dan, who's seen it thousands and thousands of times and has certain copies of some of these things that have the papers just fallen to pieces <laughs> with the thousands of times that I've inspected it closely. So we get kind of an interesting contrast yep. in, um, in uh, reactions from that. Now today we're going to be looking at uh, D&D in the 80s. 
mostly in the era of like 1983 to 1989. Mm -hmm. And this is the era of late first edition. So first edition is technically this, the game that's on the shelves at this point. But they're going, they're undergoing through some, um, you know, artistic changes, and some of them are being reprinted. Okay. Um, and then you also have the parallel basic D and D line that uh, Frank Mentzer made, which some people refer to as Beck Me. And we're going to be looking largely at three artists who are super well known in the '80s, and basically the the canonical artists of the '80s. One of them, I was looking up their bio today, and on Wikipedia, and I guess this quote was really from uh, the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Wikipedia said, um, or the, the Daily Telegraph writer said, uh, these artists are uh, part of the mid '80s fantasy art golden age. Mm. So some people would say we're we're looking at the golden age of fantasy art here today. Mm. Interesting. Which I'm looking forward to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other thing we should say is that we have been using the uh, the Art and Arcana book uh, that came out I think in 2018 as a resource. So I handed this to Isabel. Uh, came from Mr. Paul Siegel. I should point Thank out. you, Paul. Wonderful, wonderful, amazing resource to have, actually. And so I learn a bunch of stuff here. Yeah. And there's a bunch of pieces that I had not seen before and a bunch of products that I didn't have at the time. So we leave through this, and what it is, I gave Isabel that yesterday and said, how about you pick three pieces in the 80s that you really liked and three pieces that maybe you didn't like so much or things that just things that you thought were interesting or you had interesting things to say about. And we will look at most of them today. Yeah, and then Dan scrambled up everything. I that scrambled I picked. everything up, but but Isabel picked the the three main <laughs> artists, right? So Isabel oh, totally picked out the three main artists of what was supposedly fantasy art's golden age. Oh, so oh, oh, oh. Um, good, good eyes. Yeah, you definitely do. So mm. I think that makes That's... a really good platform for discussion. So let's get into it. Um, the first of the main three artists we're going to look at today is uh, named Larry Elmore. Mm -hmm. And Larry Elmore was at TSR, the Makers of D&D, from 1981 to 1987. Uh, in addition to, like, covers and adventure covers and things like that, uh, Larry created the Snarf Quest comic, which ran for many, many years in Dragon Magazine. He also worked in Magic the Gathering for quite some time. He did art for EverQuest. Um, oh, wow. Largely, you're, I'm going to be able to say the same thing about all three artists. Frankly, all three artists today worked for TSR, D&D, &D, uh, did Magic the Gathering cards, and worked on EverQuest. Oh, wow. Actually. Um, so let's look at some of... And, and Larry and Elmore did the covers of the entire Beck Me series, for what it's worth. Uh, let's look at the first one. And the very right. first thing we're looking at today might be the single most famous piece of art in all of D&D. So let's see. Let's, let's see what see we got here. All right. All right. So this is Larry Elmore's um, Red Dragon, and that was used as the cover of the D&D Basics set uh, in 1983. And so that might have been the single biggest selling D&D product of all time, possibly. Mm -hmm. An entire generation of people uh, started in D&D with that product, looking at that. Uh, it got repurposed. Um, recently, a couple years back, for the 5th edition starter set. Mm -hmm. I'll point out that the, the Art and Arcana book, there's one printing that has that, this on the cover of Art and Arcana as the single most emblematic piece ever for D&D. And I will say that I had that as a um, uh, jigsaw puzzle. In the oh, 80s. So I have nice. very carefully looked so at, you've every looked at every single piece. half inch very mm -hmm. carefully to put it back together uh -huh. as a jigsaw puzzle. Interesting. What is your reaction to Larry Elmore's The Red Dragon? Oh my gosh. Just cold like that. Um, you know, so when I was looking through, I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in, in general, you know, my reaction to the stuff that we looked, that I looked at, you know, in the, um, the chapter three of the, the Arcana book, right. you know, the, the 80s book. And, um, you know, I have to say like a lot of it kind of leaves me cold. You know, I know, I know. This is why I get disinvited. Um, so, but I'm gonna talk. I'm, 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 I'm gonna talk a little bit about about why that is. Um, you know, like what I like about art, and you know, we're gonna kind of like cycle back around um, that. You know, for some of the stuff that I picked. Um, so, what I like about art is actually, you know, kind of having the sense that there's a human being that's manipulated something. You know. Right. Um, that was a you know a tangible thing, the medium of the art, you know, and I kind of get to s get a glimpse of this person's 
um, sense of the world, right? And so the art, it's not this clean piece of artwork, you know, that um, kind of doesn't have a personality, you know, like I see, I sense that there's a person behind it, all right? And when I was looking through a lot of the artwork from the 80s, it seems like everything was really super clean. And that's kind of my problem with it. So, you know, it's like, no problem with the composition. You know, obviously this person knows what they're doing. And, you know, I could pick on the foreshortening, but, you know, why be disinvited yeah, so early right. on in the show? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, you know, for the rest of it, it, it doesn't really move me. You know, like I don't, you know, like I get it, you know, it's a dragon on a pile of gold and there's a fighter there, you know, but everything is clean. It's very cleanly done. Right. I hope that makes sense. You know, like I don't I don't get a sense that um, there was a person, you know, with a brush at some point, you know, making those strokes, you know, and using, you know, the medium. You know, like I don't even get a sense of what the medium is. You know, it's like it could be anything. So so that's my my, you know, my initial reaction to it is like it leaves me just a little bit cold because to me, you know, like art has to be you know, a connection between me, the piece that I'm looking at, and the artist behind the piece. It's not just like anybody could do this. You know, I want to get a sense of like, what do you, what do you see in the world that I don't see? You know, what, how do you feel about all of this? You know, and can we get a connection person to person through that art? Does that make sense? So. I'll say that, um, boy, I can't believe right out of the box. I, I tried to pitch, right the, I tried the to pitch the most famous piece in D&D. And um, I, I, I largely feel the same. <laughs> so, and, and I'll say this, like, like for years, I've struggled to put into words. It's funny. I've struggled to put into words exactly what my, my grief is. Gotcha. What, 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 what fails to totally hook me on a deep level, I guess, is what I right, say. Right, so right, right. So I actually have been trying to pull out pieces that I kind of liked more and had had nice things to say about, honestly. Gotcha, gotcha. And so maybe part of this is helping me find the words to, right. to critique this stuff, actually. Right, right, right. Um, let me throw up a couple more pieces by Larry Elmore. And I'll say, so the reason why we're not um, using the, the piece by Elmore that you picked out. So so Isabel, there's a piece in Art and Arcana that Isabel picked out that I want to talk about this. It's by Larry Elmore, and it's a color rough. It's a, it's a painted color study in preparation for Dragonlance materials. Okay. And I felt like maybe it wasn't totally fair to Elmore to pick on a color rough. Okay. And so I decided to pick out things that I felt were similar to that that were actually finished pieces. Was, okay. Was what I thought might be fair to him. Um, and so maybe let's look at two more and I have to... Sure. ...with this here. Just give me a second here. Uh, this and this and this. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so... Uh, there's this. So this is um, the Dragons of Autumn Twilight cover um, in 1984, one year after the, the prior piece. And I should say that, um, you know, all of the artists we're looking at today, the mid 80s had an adventure series that was really fundamental called Dragonlance. And so Dragonlance was a major campaign, I guess I'd say, by TSR. Uh, it was a combined series of adventures and novels created by uh, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss. And so they had, it was kind of like a multimedia extravaganza. This was the cover to the very first adventure, I believe. So mm -hmm. Larry Elmore made the very first cover called Dragons of um, Autumn Twilight in 84. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say part of the idea of the adventures there was that Hickman and Weiss were trying to make D&D &D more like novels, more like a narrative story, maybe, maybe less improvisation, I might say. Mm. Uh, what do you feel about this piece by Omar? I mean, I you know, I th I think it's um, I, I think I have the you know the same reaction, you know, and it's funny because it's it's almost like um, have you ever been dragged to a museum where you you know you're supposed to like look at very famous pieces of artwork, maybe you know things from like the Renaissance or something, you know, and it's uh, Jesus going like never, right? and Jesus going like this, right. you know, and uh, Mary. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, one more, you know. And uh, I, I kind of feel the same way, you know, like, it's, it's um, 
I don't I, I don't want to critique it on a on a technical standpoint. You know, I think right. you know there's there's nothing really wrong with it. Right. But you know, I'm 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 really don't I don't really feel like a very strong emotional connection to it. You know, and again, you know, like so. Here you have, you know, those three adventures that are just standing there. You know, it looks like it's very staged, you know. And so I think I think I know which one you were talking right, about right. that I was going to show. Yeah. And my, you know, I was flipping through the book and my reaction was like, hey, look, a uh, 80s metal band, you know, album cover. And it kind of feels like that, you know. So yeah. they're just standing there, you know, waiting for the adventures to start or something, you know. And in the back, you have the dragon slithering around yeah. and the dragon is not even that scary you know it's yeah. just like yeah. it's completely in view you know it's just like hey you yeah. know you can come out of behind that tree i can see you yeah. you know yeah. so there's really no mystery there's no you know i i don't have any uh, anxieties about what's about to happen or any fear or you know i don't feel like you know those people are in any great danger because obviously they're just posing for the camera you know including the dragon Right. So now, the, the, that right there is almost exactly the words I would use about that stuff. Actually, yeah. is, is 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 the the lack of danger catches my attention honestly. Right. Compared to what came before. In fact, I'm I'm working on a thesis honestly that that early D and D art from the '70s. One of the primary distinctions between that and anything that came later is that the 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 human beings, the characters, were frequently being mutilated like being like <laughs> right. torn apart yeah and and consumed on on right. camera and, and pro right. corpses like on the ground and stuff like that right and, right right and that you, you basically stop seeing that right in in later art uh maybe maybe i'll just look at one more piece by uh by elmore here so this one year later and this is the i guess the culmination of the dragonlance saga at the mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. that he made for the 1985 dragonlance car calendar Gotcha. And so you see some of the major characters of the series that appeared both the adventures and the novel forms, um, and uh, they're you know they're they're kind of posed. Yeah, they're they're kind of posed, yeah. and you know again you know it's just like there's really nothing wrong with it you know and you know and if you like it that's fine you know it's not you know I'm not saying that you know everybody should feel the same way as I do right. but you know. I, I just don't feel really a big connection yeah. to it, you know, and, and, and you know, it's funny because when we started the series and I was thinking about Art of D&D, I was actually thinking about those types of pieces gotcha. because I've seen, gotcha. you know, working in video games, you know, um, you know, with other artists that were working on, on, on pieces like that, you know, and they kind of had that same style, you know, and I was just kind of like, meh, you know, it's not, it's just not for me, you know, um, you know, the... I don't know, everybody's hair is like very flowy yeah. and, you know, and nobody has any blood or sweat right. or right. dirt or, or grit. whatever or right. grit to it. Yes. You know, uh, it's just, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, there's, there's also a lack of focus, you know, so it's just kind of like this whole piece and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I keep going around and around and around, you know, and I'm not quite sure like who I should, you know, who's more important than anything, you know, um... So, and you know, I've seen yeah. that piece many, many times over the years. Yeah. And for some reason, just getting because I'm sitting two feet away from it, for some reason, I'm finally realizing that the things on the far left and right are, I guess, the, that guy's pauldrons, I guess. Like the big, the big, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't know Dragonlance character names. So the, the, oh, the okay. big helmeted guy at the back, I guess you see his black pauldrons on the left and right. And I, yeah. never, I never even read what those were. Properly. Gotcha, oh, gotcha, wow. gotcha. Yeah. yeah, and the one thing that actually, you know, and, and sorry, I'm just, you know, we're just dissing on that. Yeah, I know. You know, um, like the, the colors are, you know, and I think I told you that before. It's just like it seems like it's all like very uh, primary colors, you know. Uh -huh. there's, uh, uh -huh. And I'm not sure if that's, and I should have looked at that. I'm, I'm not sure if that's an artifact of the printing process, you know, that uh, in, in the 80s. And maybe there were some limitations on what you could do with color. Mm -hmm. But the colors also, you know, feel like very clean. Yeah. You know, very clean, very saturated, um, you know, and very, uh, very, um, you know, just just in the primary range more than anything else. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's we'll, let's, we'll move, let's on. move on. So, so let's I, move I'll on. say that when the '80s came around, like in that era for me, like I I was confused. I was confused what to think because they're clearly a much higher level of production, right? And they're a much higher level of, frankly, skill, I guess. Yeah. Than what yeah. came before, and yet it it kind of didn't quite hook me. Yeah, I, I can I, see that. For years, I've been struggling to explain explain that weird 
that weird split on my part. Right, right, um, right. So here's the thing I should I should throw it for context is these pieces, these three pieces for Elmore were 1983, 1984, 1985. Okay. Now this isn't a con. This isn't a historical context whereby in not, right before that, in 1982. As as D and D became very popular and was a fad, and the basic set all of a sudden started started selling like hotcakes, there was a moral panic. The right. moral panic of D and D happened in 1982, and there were a couple of cases where unfortunately families lost members, and they were looking for something to blame. Right, and suddenly there was a there was a media frenzy as as. One or two investigators decided to blame DNT. Right, it was the for, video game of the time. Like, it was a video know, game of the time. Our right. youth are out of control, and it's because of DNT. Absolutely. Nowadays, some people refer to that as the satanic panic. Right. It's not a term that I heard at the time, but that's what people refer to it now by. And um, there was an organization started called Bad. So we all, you know, Mad Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Well, there right. was a Bad Bothered About D and D that got started up by, by again I'm, one of the family members. I'm a little bothered. Yep. About yep. <laughs> Made pamphlets. They were got a lot of media attention. They were giving interviews and stuff like that. And so TSR had to respond to that. Oh uh, yeah. So maybe that that's mm-hmm. what we're seeing as a reaction to that. Yep. Yeah, um, and so in art, our can art in Arcana. Um, I, I hadn't seen this before opening up that 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 book. There, they've got a memo uh, to the TSR uh, executive staff mm. from Duke Seifried. I think is how you say that. Uh, dated June seventh, uh, nineteen eighty two. So mm. that just thirty nine years ago, I guess. Um, and in part, what it says is, "Here are the new guidelines. All caps. Here are the guidelines gotcha. uh, designed to create a wholesome." Yet, interesting impression to the public. Uh, we do not wish to be offensive mm-hmm. to our potential customers. Mm-hmm, yet, mm-hmm. by the same token, we do not need to eliminate the spark that intrigues the buyer. Well, that explains it all. You know? Because yeah. that is a big switch yeah. where, you know, you you have, like, some interesting stuff that we talked about. Like, the yeah. first the first time we did this uh, this show on, uh, on Art of D&D. And, um, you know, I was just looking through this chapter going, there's really nothing that really grabs my attention. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I picked out, I picked out some other pieces, right, in an, attempt, in an attempt to intrigue you and me together. So let's look at the same, same time era here. Let's look at Clyde Caldwell. And I, I picked out three pieces by Clyde Caldwell. Okay. Now, um, he... Uh, um, uh, let me see. So before joining TSR, he did covers for Heavy Metal Magazine. Okay. Specifically, I understand he did covers for Bar Soom, which is to say the John Carter stories mm. by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, and then he joined TSR in 1982 and stayed there about 10 years. Uh, oh, left okay. in 1992. So he's there quite a while. Maybe even more well known than Larry Elmore, arguably. I don't know. I, I gotta right. pull up Let's the right find out. Image here. <laughs> So, okay. So the first one here, I feel is like, it's just, it's really right in the wheelhouse of Clyde Caldwell. Okay. So, and, and again, a very famous piece. So there's this. So this is the cover piece to Curse of the Azure Bonds. And again, that was kind of a multimedia. There was a novel, there was an adventure, there were video games. Um, the original uh, adventure was written by Jeff Grubb who we had on as a guest on Wandering Games last season, actually. You can see the, the main character on, the, on her right forearm. She's got a blue tattoo. So that's the, okay. the curse of the Azure Bonds, I believe, is a cursed tattoo that controls you, I guess. Uh, so again, very, very famous. Lots and lots of people adore that adventure and mm-hmm. that video game and that novel at the time. Super famous. Like maybe, like at the time, certainly the biggest D&D video game to date. And that is very Clyde Caldwell-y. You can kind of see the, the stylized C on the far right there. It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a very Clyde Caldwell-y piece. Um, what do you think of the cover to Curse of the Azure Bonds? Well, I, I, I think the boobaliciousness is very wholesome. <laughs> Indeed, very wholesome. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I, I mean, not, you know, it's funny now that you told me about about that. You know, I think I'm going to yeah. look at, uh, at those things like a... In a slightly different way, you know, it was just like the monsters are obviously they're they're no threat, yeah. you know, and yeah. uh, and everybody's just kind of like, you know, uh, posing for the camera and looking far off in the distance at yeah. whatever, you know, the very distant fighting. Don't worry, kids, 
you know, no violence yeah. here. But it's actually kind of funny that, you know, <laughs> so, so the, the violence was not okay, but the sexual uh, content is actually okay, which is sort of the reverse of what we have these days, you know, in well, movies and all that, right? So, you know, you, you really don't want to, you know, depict you know, people being so sexualized anymore, yeah, yeah. you know, and, but violence is perfectly okay. You know, you have like a, a lot of very violent movies. Yeah, so yeah. that's actually kind of in, uh, an interesting yeah. take. Yeah. You know, what's kind of funny with a lot of stuff. So, um, so to me, they look like uh, hyper realistic, you know, like a, right. especially the right. faces, yeah. you know, and that kind of like, um, shows the hairstyle of the time and so all the hairstyle of all the people right. is very 80s right you know? so i'm looking at her going oh yeah i think linda ronstadt you know uh, wore uh, her hair just like that That's part, some of the promotions that i put out for this show said get ready for big hair yeah exactly well oh, there was one in particular the one where where i was laughing about the uh this is a cover for a heavy metal band but she right. has like this big giant perm and i'm like yeah I had that perm, okay. definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we all did. <laughs> we thought it was great. <laughs> you know, I was looking at. You know, I didn't. I didn't prepare it for the show, but I was looking at the cover. The 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 most famous D and D adventure of all time called Adve Ad Against the Giants. Okay. And there's, there's you you would fight against giants, and then you fight against dark elves, and then finally you fight against the queen of the demon spiders. And they recompiled it in a giant compilation, and they made a new piece of art on the front uh, around I think 1987 or so. And the, 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 the spider demon goddess in her human form is clearly Tina Turner from <laughs> Mad Max Beyond Thundergone. It's, 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 it's the same dress. It's the same, same hair. Haircut. It's 100% Tina Turner from Beyond Thundergone. It's precisely that. Yeah. Right? Um, so they were really, you know, digging into the pop themes of the time. Yeah, and you can definitely yeah, yeah. see that. Well, I'm kind of wondering. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to remember actually what album covers look like. And I wonder if there was like... You know, there are trends, you know, like within within art and graphic art, you know, that where everybody kind of like does the same thing. And I'm just wondering if if there were trends at the time that I, I'm just not remembering, you know, and basically like all of this, you know, you know, was within its time and, you know, and everybody thought it was great at the time because, you know, maybe that was new and, you know, nobody else was doing it, um, you know, and I would look back and I was like, oh, that's very dated. You know, it's very dated and, you know, not super interesting as, as, as art. I do. I feel so. like, you know, that, I, bet, I bet that's that's part of it. And I really think that the executive hammer from the top yeah. of TSR uh, probably constrained the artists quite a bit yes. at the time. And among, you know, among the things at the time was they were expunging things like references to demons or devils. Right. So in original in, in original and first of D and D, there was a, a, a sizable part of the monster manual that, you know, dedicated to demons and devils mm. and uh, the Balrog from um, Tolkien. Um, and um, you know, and, and and Gygax was using actual medieval, you know, demonology right. lists for inspiration. That very much came under fire, and so as as a defense in this era, they were really hardcore expunging right. and removing references to right. that kind of stuff. So right. I feel like the 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 change in this era to more business like control uh, is is probably a major thing that we're seeing here. Right, right. Um, That's fascinating. Yeah. I had, you know I I I guess I, I had re I hadn't fo I hadn't remembered that you know that was happening at the time. Yeah, you yeah. know. And and for some of us, it's very much on our minds. You know, uh, I mentioned that um, the Dragonlance series that all these guys worked on, written by, uh, created by Tracy Hickman, Margaret Weiss, uh, hoping to get one of them on the show, actually. At oh, some very point. nice. And for what it's worth, just yesterday before we recorded this, I saw Margaret Weiss on social media saying, you know, the, the satanic panic of the 80s was a real big problem. And Margaret was writing, my son uh, was in school at the time, and his teacher found out that his mother worked for the creators of D&D &D and mm. pulled him aside and said, do you torture animals? Oh, and my God. And just assume that we were a family <laughs> of, of devil worshippers. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and took it upon herself to save Margaret Weiss's son at the time. And uh, right. for, 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 for younger people, they don't realize how, how very much that has scarred 
right. a particular generation of D and D players, and even for myself, for many many years. I mean, the truth is, right? My blog has has the you know is is under the byline Delta because for many years, honestly, I hid my identity, mm-hmm. and and I, I wasn't I didn't feel secure about admitting that Dan Collins uh, uh, plays D and D, and it wasn't until fairly recently that a, a, you know a different generation came up and I was dealing with younger people and they didn't have these same the same baggage mm. um, and uh, the point is it's it's very that 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 level of unsafety is very some of us are very hyper conscious to us uh, uh, to that and I'm so happy that that younger people don't have to oh, for sure. exactly that same problem yeah, and for me it's totally not on my mind you know like my family is a bunch of heathens <laughs> And, you know, I grew up in France. That's very secular, you know. So, you know, not, not going to church is, is, is not a problem, you know. And saying to someone that you're an atheist is not a problem. Right. Um, so to me, it's, 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 it's never really, like, religion is, is always like, oh, yeah, right. You know, people think about that, you know. Uh, and I never do. Yeah. So, you know, it's never, I, it, it's never like my first thought of like, <laughs> it's like, oh, people think you're a, Satan worshiper, and for me, it's funny because it's just ridiculous. Yeah. But people take it very seriously. No, no we had people you know. had you know people were you know put in you know isolation, put yeah. in you know summer camps to try to get them out of right. that kind of thing. Right, right, right. Like like you know, which is obviously very bad. And any any other any similar thing right. where people go through that is awful. Right. Um, so I got I got two other things lined up here to talk about Clyde Caldwell. Okay. Now one of the things about about Caldwell, and so here you see two famous um, uh, products authored by Gary Gygax, and on the left uh, you have the second novel of a big series featuring his character Gord the Rogue um, uh, on the left there. Uh, and the the cover art to that is uh, made by Clyde Caldwell, and so were all the novels uh, featuring Gord the Gord the Rogue at TSR. Mm-hmm. On the right, um, you've got the character Mordenkainen. Now, for decades, I said Mordenkainen, and then when, when we had Ernie Gygax on the show last season, he was saying Mordenkainen. So I need to I need to change. As usual, I need to change this thing I never said out loud. <laughs> um, and so you have Gary Gygax's own player character that he used to play in uh, games DM'd by Rob Kuntz, uh, Morden Kynan. Um, and frankly, and again, uh, the art is done by Clyde Caldwell. The piece looks a little bit like Gary Gygax himself, a little bit. Interesting. And so my point here is that Caldwell was tapped for the most auspicious pieces of the time. And Gary Gygax's most famous characters, Caldwell was tapped as the artist to do them in uh, 1980. I think the thing on the right is 1984, and the thing on the left is 1986. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that this is right at the point where Gary Gygax gets run out of the company. Oh, wow. So Gary Gygax was forced to leave uh, the company in 1985, uh, right as these are kind of his last products to to be published at TSR. I think the sec. I think the one on the left came out after he was departed. Actually, um, wow, that's fascinating. Right, and so again, it's on the one hand. I don't know if that shows that Gygax himself adored Caldwell's art, or or whether that shows that Gygax didn't have control over that anymore. Right, right. What do you think right. about those pieces? Well. I actually like the piece on the left. I think it's got like a really nice composition, and it's got at least some um, little uh, surprises. You know, yeah. the more you look at it, it's got some little surprises, yeah. so you can see there. You know, you think that they're you know engulfed in you know engulfed mm-hmm. in flame, but then mm-hmm. you're like, oh, it's like a little chariot of a uh, flame or something. So I don't know if if they're on a uh, burning it's a chariot, chariot. A chariot of Sustair, which is a seventh uh, level druid spell, which allows you to fly through the air in a burning, defensive, defendable chariot. Love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think at least this time, you know, it really feels like the dragon is genuinely right? threatening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so. Uh, you know, I, th- I think there's something a little, a little bit better there. You know, for me in terms of like, you know, what's going to happen is, you know, it's more of an action pose, and you know, um, although I'm not, I'm not thrilled by by the woman, you know, what? exposing all her what? skin in a flaming chariot. <laughs> you know, you're gonna burn those boobs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> Great take. Now, okay, so here's another thing is that all of the artists that we're looking at have, have websites, actually. So, and it's just their name.com in, in all three cases. There you go. So you can go to LarryElmore.com and see more of his work. And, and Larry is still active, and he has pieces for sale. ClydeCaldwell.com you can go to. Later on, there's, there's a KeithParkinson.com. And I will say that if you go to, you know, if you go to their individual sites, you're going to see things that they did independently, right, right, that weren't part of the TSR corporate structure. Right, that are very cases, different. Right, sometimes, in some cases, they're much riskier. Mm-hmm. Well, at least they're somewhat riskier. And I will say that uh, Clyde Caldwell pieces are much more cheesecake than you're seeing here today. It's like, it's, it, you go to ClydeWell.com and you want more cheesecake. Right. Cheesecake as far as the eye can see. So frankly, the pieces for TSR are toned down quite a bit. All right, well then... Uh, on that angle. On that... On that note, right. uh, let's look at, uh, can we look at something that I liked? Okay, well, okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, so well, here so here comes, I'm so glad you asked. So here I'm comes sorry. a piece that you did specifically ask to look at and it is by Clyde Caldwell, and it's this. So this is right. a piece from the 1985 uh, Dragonlance calendar, and a really great thing they put in Art and Arcana was they put the, and this, I'm sorry, this wasn't the best scan of anything, I apologize for that. But on the right, you've got the finished piece that actually was published, and if you left, you have the original pencil sketch. Why? Why did you want to look at this in particular, as well? Well, there were a couple of examples in the book where you had um, the study or the sketch uh, of a finished piece, and in all cases, I like the study better. So in this one in particular, um, there's a couple of things that I really like about it. First of all, you have this like ball of light that basically starts to erase mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know so you really get a sense that this like this really glowing thing Great, yeah, you know yeah. that's kind of like maybe it's you know a spell run amok you know yep. that's kind of like gonna take oh, over the page right oh, yeah. and what i like actually is the eyes on the left i know right right yeah so if you look at the eyes of you know whoever you know right. I, I don't know who he is if he's the druid you know yeah. incanting the spell or whatever you know he's kind of look he looks a little worried yeah. or something you know there's something yeah. about him that's just like you know he's just there's something going on with his eyes you know like I he's agree. he's he's like oh maybe this was such, that's such a good idea to do this <laughs> you know? but he's got like some reaction whereas you know the finished product is is you know he's closing his eyes and i'm not quite sure what he's thinking anymore and it's the same with the dragon so i actually yeah. on the right the finished product he looks um like he's uh you know, against what's happening and, you know, has like this very ferocious look. Great, great, great. Whereas on the left, he looks like, oh, dude, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> this thing is glowing way too much. Uh, and the one in the back also has like a much nicer expression. So, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so oh, yeah. so it's it, so it's funny because, you know, that that's happened to me where, you know, I, I do studies for something. And the studies end up being way yeah. better than the finished product. And I don't know if you just kind of like overthink the the finished product. Like why did he make the eyes closed yeah. instead of keeping them that way? You know, and maybe he was directed to do that. Who knows? You know. But to me, that sketch on the on the left that we saw was way more interesting than the finished piece. And also because you know you do get a sense of it's a piece of artwork. You know, I see the pencil strokes. I see that there's someone that's actually that's done this by hand. You know, whereas the piece on the uh, on the right is it, again is it's clean. Everything is clean. The lines are clean. Yeah. The inking is clean. The, you know, like you you don't go over the line at all. You know, like everything is within. Cla- the line. Caldwell is super clean. Caldwell mm. is just super clean, and I don't think I mean I don't think I've ever seen like a piece of his where there's like a broken weapon. Mm. Right, everything is like. Really super clean. Now that piece right there had a couple of cobwebs in the corner that I could see better in the sketch. And then, frankly, if I was just looking at the color painting, I couldn't. I, they got lost on it. Yeah, me. maybe. Um, and but the, the but I agree. The main thing that and and the the in the color version of the dragon kind of is a little bit glassy eyed, just a little bit. Right. Right. But the main thing in that piece, I agree, is is uh, not have that's not a piece that I'm super familiar with. But looking at the two pieces side by side, I'm like. 
why didn't you keep the eyes open? Right. The, the eyes open kind of scared and like realize realization and trying to maybe trying to get help from the dragon or like, something like, like that. Oops, I made a mistake. I know. What a what a giant to me, what a giant difference. Yeah. In having the eyes open and that right. that left me super quizzical about why did you decide to, to right. remove the eyes? Because that right. was like to me the most important part of the piece. Right. And that was and it's among the biggest um um differences the one of the biggest changes between any of the sketches and any of the final pieces right is it totally changes the texture of the piece right right yeah. right right definitely um um okay so i think that was it okay so that's it for caldwell and i'm really glad you picked out that before and after sketch piece and and you're just... and uh, for hate mail uh send everything to uh d collins <laughs> It's, He'll it's, forward it's, everything to me. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not finishing the rest of that mm. that address. So so kind. Um, uh, um, and and also a great observation about in the in the sketch the 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 orb erasing stuff around it, right. which is just not something that could be replicated with his painting technique. No, he could, he could have done it. Yeah. I, th I feel like he really could have yeah. done that as well. Well, I mean, like his. Oh, the like one his, he yeah. Used, right, right, the one right. that he used yeah. in all of his paintings in D&D &D is right. just not something that you would see. Right. It's super concrete. It's just yeah. super concrete. That's what I mean. Like, he's, he's coloring, like, yeah. within the lines. He's not, you know, just exploding things. Yeah. So. Uh, do this and do this. Okay. And the uh, the third um, the third person I wanted to talk about, and maybe if we have extra time, we'll talk about some other people later, um, is uh, Keith Parkinson. Um, same kind of story there. He was at TSR from 1982 to 1987, I believe. And again, outside of TSR, he worked on EverQuest and Magic the Gathering, and he did covers for Dragon Lance novels written by Tracy Hickman and, and Margaret Weiss and so forth. Uh, now the the other guys are still working today. Unfortunately, Parkinson uh, passed away in two thousand five from okay. leukemia. Unfortunately, um, he was actually, I believe, a studio partner of Larry Elmore. So Elmore was oh. very very close to Parkinson. And again, uh, you Isabel picked out uh, a couple pieces by Parkinson. And so this the first one you haven't seen yet, and then the other two um, are ones you specifically picked out. So the one that I wanted to to, to look at that I feel is pretty Parkinsony mm -hmm. is this. And this was the cover to um, the uh, TSR product, Lankmar, the City of Adventure in 1985. Mm -hmm. And depicted there are possibly the two most famous um, uh, characters in fantasy novels. It, who is that? Do you know? Is that Mouser and, and uh, uh, Pfeiffer? Is that it's the, exactly who yeah. that is. So it's yeah. uh, on the left, it's the Grey Mouser, and on the right, it's Fafford. Uh, of course, created by uh, famous author Fritz Lieber, who who licensed and actually was a big fan of D and D, wrote some pieces in Dragon Magazine and licensed them for some products. And uh, Keith Parkinson was the one to tap would tapped to depict them and the city of the the, the decrepit city of Lankmar, uh, inspired by New York City. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's why you have all the rats. There you go. Right. <laughs> so around you know it's funny because again I I think in the in the product. Right, this got cropped, so I think in the published uh, product you don't see their feet, and not until just yesterday I didn't realize that there are rats around Fafford's left foot there. Uh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, I see they kind of slightly get lost. Yes. Um, and you know what? Look, I'll come. I'll come right out. And the first time I saw this product, I didn't immediately recognize them as Fafford and the Grey Mouser. They oh, really? I I, yeah. I I immediately okay. thought about oh, that. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. yeah. When you said that, okay, yeah. Great. So, um. So now I have to tell you what I think about it, right? If you're willing. I mean, you know, I'm just like, you know, I'm like, there are things that I like, I swear, you know, there right. will be things that I like. Right. Um, this again, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. It's it's a little stiff to me, you yeah. know, like the, the, you know, I, you know, I, I recognize, and it's a little bit more interesting, you know, you've got the medieval-ish town and, yes, good you point. know, good um, point. It's got you know, some depth to it. It's got it. some nice depth to it. Down you know, it's, it's receding very nicely. And, you know, and there's some stuff going on in the back. This kind of like this mysterious figures, you know, shadowy figures, like all the way past, you know, the, right. the two black figures, actually, the black robe figures. You mm -hmm. know, you can see there's like more stuff going on. So um, the ladies are a little bit clean, you right. know, uh, so that kind of like, and because they're so bright, they take away my focus, yes. you know, so it, it's 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 a little bit jarring to have them, you know. I, you know, if I had been the art director, I would have said to tone them down yeah. just a little bit. 
um, so that you had more, um, you know, in, in the two main characters. Um, I like the rats. I think that's kind of a really nice touch I to never have that. I the rats until yeah. just last night. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, again, you know, like the, the, the features, again, you know, there's something about them that's like, that's, that's not quite grabbing me and I'm not so sure, and, you know, and there's, there's this phenomenon that actually that people talk about with um, uh, uh, hyper realism in, in video games. Yes. Where, you know, like the features have become really, really close. Right. To photorealistic figures. Right. But they're not quite there yet. And because we're so used to looking at human beings, we kind of have this weird reaction to seeing something that's should be human but it's not quite there yet and i feel that it's a little you know all those things you know are are giving me that you know like i and of course that's called the uncanny valley is what a lot oh, of people okay. call that right? yeah. yeah and so i kind of feel like this this is giving me that vibe a little bit where you know like you know like obviously i know this is a drawing so i know they're not real humans but it looks so real and yet there's something that's not quite right so, you know, it's, it's giving me a weird reaction, but probably not for the right reason. Yeah. And, so. and I, I would assume that they're probably working from, you know, actual photographs or an actual yeah. model. And, you know, in comic books, um, who is really, who's the big cover artist? Alex Ross uh, is, is, is hugely famous, um, uh, mostly DC uh, comic cover artist. And he works the same way as he has models, he poses them, he takes photos, mm. and then by hand he replicates the photos as paintings. Right. And I I have this uncanny valley feeling from Alex Ross covers. And yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't feel I've ever seen Alex Ross really convince me of like an action shot. Mm -hmm. Like I don't see, I, I've never seen him convincingly throw a punch because his models have Are to be stopped. fixed in face mm -hmm. in place right they're not really flexing right and that's kind of a bit of a of a uh, restriction on his his particular uh, process right and also things on fire don't super work well for me because all right. he does is just take a negative anyway so so i agree that that kind that process of like we're going to make it super realistic probably work from a model or a photo I, I totally, I totally I think agree. It's, with yeah, that. it's yeah. got some problems for and, me. For me, yeah. And know. it's interesting in this era. I feel that like, like, oftentimes I describe this as the. It looks very glamour shoddy, right? That's a really good way to put right? it. Right. Yeah. And obviously, glamour shots is the actual company that does you know photographs for people before a right. prom or whatever. Well, especially with the hair. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. like this long flowing yeah. hair. And and they're and I'm like, come on, all the hair was ratty. They didn't yeah. have a shower. Right. You know, they haven't showered in two weeks. Right. Exactly. So that's that's a thing that They've I didn't read them. I didn't read them as Fafford and the Grey Mouser. And they're, right. they're their, their cloak and their, their, their jewelry and stuff is just totally it's pristine. Clean. And that's not what I ever got from those guys, you know, hacking through right multiple bodies and probably right. going through the sewer and all that kind of stuff right exactly and getting rained on and, and if the rats are interested in your foot you, you your boots are probably not so clean you would think so yeah you would i think mean so. i'm just saying yeah. and know. it's interesting because so in this era right they've, they've transitioned so there you have faffer and the gray mouser which are known famous characters and they're trying to do the same thing with Dragonlance. so mm. they're trying to make intellectual property where you have recognized characters and they live for a long time, and you Got can it. pick up new novels and adventures and recognize them. And, and to recognize the names and recognize the faces as a selling point up front, right, way up front right. in the art. Whereas previously, the, you know, the, the player characters were fundamentally there to be victims. Right. Um, and to be by, chewed up by the process most of the time. <gasps> right. And so it's, to me, it's like a big, it's a big switch. And to a large extent, you know, it's kind of an obvious business transaction i guess to promote faces and people and characters that are recognizable and will come back you do that in movies with actors and stuff like that and um and that's carried through to today so so right. i think like well, a lot of the art today is the same thing as they try to you know they they want to create recognizable people whereas you know for some of us D is a system like it's a system to simulate right. a world right and here they're trying to make the IP about a particular character name and face. And I would say that a lot of like it's particularly the fan art today with fifth edition DD looks the same. It's a it's a it's a beloved character, front and center, and they're frequently don't have a background around them at all. 
and um, I feel like that has uh, that that trend has continued ever since they started that in this era. And that's actually very '80s to have like this, you know, business first, yeah, and everything else yeah. second. Yeah, you know, like that's gonna drive it. You know, whether it becomes good art, good art or bad art, it's kind of irrelevant. You know, it's just like we need to make a buck. You know, yeah. so yeah, and I think you know that that started in the '80s, and like you said, you know, that trend of like you know capitalism driving everything you know is continuing uh you, you're just not going to show the the the, the piece I that, I, that i that i that i that i want to talk about are you? like maybe this piece no there's another piece okay. i want to talk about okay. but this piece i really like actually okay so this piece i really like you know and again you know um there's 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 something about it first of all you know this this dragon looks extremely threatening right 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 and there's something about it where, you know, I feel like it's super different from everything that we've yeah. seen in terms of the texture. You know, you get like a really nice deep texture of everything, you know, like, right. you know, you see him as like this really scaly monster, you know, and you're not sure if he's got hair or scale or Great. dirt or what the hell is going on Great. with his mouth. Yeah. And that actually, you know, now I'm, I'm looking at this. I, when, do you know when this was made, Okay, actually? so this is the very first issue of Dungeon Magazine, and it was published in 1988. Oh, 88, because yeah. I was, I was going to say, you know, it looks a little bit like, uh, like the Aliens uh, in, oh. in, in the oh. Alien movie. Oh. But that came out way earlier than that, True. you know, like yeah. especially True. the, you know, the, the jaw and the teeth. Right. You know, they're just kind of like, oh, no, this yeah. thing is going to unhinge and like, you know, come yeah. and eat me. Um, so this I like a lot, you know, and again, you know, like the, you, the colors are not like this hyper saturated colors, mm -hmm. you know, he sort of disappears in the background, you know, you know, he kind of like fades in the background. So you're like, this thing is ginormous, you know, <laughs> because, you know, I can see that there's this big cavern over there and he's just like lost in there. Um, and you know, there's, there's like a really, uh, you know, deep sense of like, you know, where the focus is, you know, yeah. whereas before, you know, I was just like, oh, I have to look all over the place. And here I'm just like, I'm looking at his face, I'm looking at his eyes and his teeth and those nostrils. And I'm just like, I am in big trouble. <laughs> I, 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 and, I, and I'm convinced he's in a place because because he's right. actually connected his his hand i feel is actually on a piece of rock or whatever right i feel that his feet are in the treasure i can i can kind right. of hear the 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 coins clinking as he shuffles around right. in it right and i'm convinced he's actually in a location and not just composited on top of a location and i feel like you know i'm a player that just walked into a place yeah. where i think i'm gonna have this really great right. treasure and instead i see this there right. is a great treasure and right. you know so we're in a dungeon it's kind of dark it's kind of dim yeah yeah you know yep. uh not everything is just popping and you know so i you know that that actually was like when i looked at all the pieces that was the, the one that i liked the most um in, in terms of like you know making me feel like i'm actually part of right you know, the game and this is what's gonna happen in you know in my imagination, you know, as I'm playing through. Right, right. So yeah, so I really like that piece a lot. I'm I'm so, I was I was oh, thrilled when you picked it out, right? Thank so God when Isabel I she I, found one that she liked. My, my guidance was pick out six pieces that you want to talk about. And again yeah. I we we're not seeing the exact same six pieces, but I'm using it as an inspiration right. for similar stuff. And so of the six pieces in that chapter that Isabel picked out, I was thrilled um, when she did, uh, because uh, that and that that character is named Flame, um, it's a good and he's a top level, very old, huge genius intelligence spell using fire breathing dragon in the adventure into the fire. And the thing that I'm particularly thrilled about is that when Paul and I started running a boss fight for breakfast sessions at some conventions a couple of years ago, um, that was the first one. Yeah. And, and, and you we played, were there. and you played the dragon. And I played that dragon. Yeah. And so I have an enormously soft spot of 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 recognition, frankly, identification with that picture mm -hmm. because we had such a blast, and I had such a blast, you know, trying to play genius dragon and outthink six or seven really great D and D players. Uh -huh. Um, that that uh, that that experience that that we now know some people refer to as the adversary player. Um, was the inspiration for our uh, you know, live play show, The Big Bad. Um, that, the Big uh, Bad. If you haven't checked it out, you should. That we had such a blast with and just such wonderful celebrity players for season one. Now it's entirety on uh, YouTube. You can watch all of season one of The Big Bad. And 
a whole lot of work. Took us a whole lot, whole year to put mm-hmm. together. Great support from Dwarven Forge, all kinds of great players, and and we wouldn't have had that idea if it weren't for that piece by Keith Parkinson. Mm. Frankly, that that was the the initial inspiration that caused Paul to pick up that adventure. Interesting, and me to get roped into it, and me playing that character. Frankly. Um, was was pu- what put us on the road to that creation. So when so you, we will call that a successful piece of artwork. That's a super successful piece of yeah. artwork, and I'm thrilled. You know, the other thing is the 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 editor's note to that issue said that the treasure there. Uh, suppose Parkinson had looked at like 50 pieces of 17th 18th century museum pieces to put the uh-huh. art together. Actually, so he there yeah. was clearly there was clearly a lot of joy and creativity right, going into that. Right. 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 Um, here's, here's, here's the last piece by Parkinson. This is something you picked out of uh, Art and Arcana. Is this? This. Yeah, so this is, um, actually another example of, you know, me thinking that the drawing, you know, the study that he did. And actually, you know, I'm seeing it a little bit bigger. I I like, I like the finished piece a little bit better. Um, but I still think the drawing has something to it that, you know, kind of got a little bit lost, um, in, in the finished piece. And so this actually, I wanted to bring up, so, you know, I, I was doing a little bit of research before the show. So there's a German artist from um, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, called Kathy Kollwitz. Okay, okay. Uh, and she's done, a, a, a lot of the drawings that, that I like by her are uh, drawings. Oh, you can you can leave that okay. on. Okay, yeah, well, let's, we, t- let's talk. We can go back. Okay, we'll, I we'll hear go back. About this. So uh, she um, she d- uh, did a lot of uh, drawings with charcoal, you know, and charcoal has a very nice quality of like, um, you know, to, I don't know, to just express anguish, I guess. Okay, yeah. And yep. So, uh, so she's got an interesting life. So she uh, was married to a physician, uh, and she would go on rounds with him, and she actually did a lot of drawings of uh, sick people, people oh. dying. Oh, wow. uh, so his, uh, her husband uh, mostly worked with like very poor people. Okay. So she, you know, she she actually has like a lot of drawings that you know show a lot of emotional anguish. And so okay. she is kind of like um, considered to be part of like a German expressionist artist. So you know the idea is not necessarily that you have something that's like super clean or super realistic, you know, but you kind of like you look at her drawings and you really get a sense of like the misery and uh, the fear and, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, someone is about to die, you know, um, in, in those drawings. And there's something about it that, you know, uh, that dro- particular drawing actually reminded me of, of her drawings, you know. Um, so, you know, you've got, I don't know, you've got something about, you know, the way, the way that his marks are made, you know, like all those diagonals, you know, and nothing is like necessarily like super crisp. Um, and especially you have like the dragons that are going around yeah. that are actually becoming again, you know, yeah. part of the background. So, you know, they, they, they become a little bit more threatening because they're not yeah. obvious at first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. same with, you know, the, um, the kind of like skulls in, in the rocks, oh. you know, right. And you, oh, that you see in the, in the bottom and yeah. here, you know, you see another skull up here and here, like, I don't know if it's a bird or something. Right, right. So, you know, there's oh, something wow. like that's very uh mysterious and you know and that comes from like how he's using his medium you know how he's using his material you know that kind of like adds to the drawing so it's not just like you know this weird tower with you know dragons circling around or you know this weird floating island there's something really ominous about it and it really comes from the way that he handled um you know uh his 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 um his actual paint material, gotcha. his, his actual drawing material. And I feel like it's a little bit lost in the finished product. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. again, you know, and, you know, again, I don't, you know, you, you you couldn't have, you know, a drawing like that as a cover. I think, you know, I, I don't think anybody you know, would have been necessarily well received. In first edition, or, or at least original d and I feel like that would be on the table. I would be, yeah. might have, you might have actually done that at a, at a prior time, but yeah. not in this area. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I feel, you know, so and you're losing that sense of, like, really dark light, you know, so yeah. in, in the finished one, you know, because yeah. you have, now you want to see, you know, the humans mm-hmm. on horses, you know, mm-hmm. um, probably fleeing from this floating island, you know, and so there's more light on them, so, you know, you, you kind of, like, 
lose the sense of um, this really dark, horrible things that are that's about to happen. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you know, to, to me that was that. You know, again, you know, I've done this where, you know, you do a study and you're like, oh, this is great, you know, and then you do the finished yeah. product and you're like, oh, that didn't work. Um, you know, and, and and I feel like the drawing here, you know, to that really speaks to me in a in a Kathy Colwitz kind of way, you know, like I can I can I can feel what the artist was trying to do. I can feel, you know, some of the anguish, you know, that he's trying to communicate to me. Uh, and that is done through the way he's handling the medium. So and, and to me, that's what like a really good piece of artwork is. That's great. So, I, do you think that, that the, the sketch on the right, is that pencil or is that charcoal? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time actually, um, you know, it, it looks like it could be pencil actually, yeah. you know, like a, like a very, um, very fat pencil. Right, right. You know. Um, like five, yeah. or something like that. No, F is, is, is um, so it's more like a okay. B, gotcha, gotcha. like a five, right, B, right, four right, B right, kind right. of thing. You yeah, have, I can't not see that bird now. Oh. <laughs> the, the kind of middle right of the sketch there's right. this bird right. looking back to its left right. and now I can't I, that's the only thing I see in that sketch right, right and, and actually you don't even you, you actually lose all of that yeah, in yeah, the yeah. finished product so I don't know if you was told like no no you can't have that you know because you, you know you have like a little bit of the skull so if you see like maybe a third from the top right. there's like this kind of like terrace yeah, going across yeah, 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 and yeah. underneath in yeah, the okay. sketch, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's like skulls, yeah. you know, and it's still kind of there in the finished product, but mm -hmm. not as prominent, right. you know. Like in in the drawing, you know, it's like it's definitely made out of skulls. This thing is, you know, partially right. made out of skulls, and it's not as obvious in the in it, the in the finished. It's piece. funny seeing having seen the left many many times. I feel like I I I I, I, I come with pre expectations about what I'm going to see in this piece and all the stuff you're talking about in the sketch, I failed to actually observe, frankly. Oh, that's interesting. Um, one thing I'll say is the thing on the left is cropped. And I've, I've seen, so that this is how it appears in Art, Art and Arcana. Jeez, that's hard to say out loud. I'm just realizing now that I'm doing a show on it. <laughs> but I've seen a fuller piece online where, the, where it's, it's, it's wider. I see. And the lighting issue at the bottom that you're talking about, I feel, works a lot better. Because gotcha. in the wider piece, you have this, like, red spot in the middle, and then it turns into, like, darkness on the uh, left I and see. right. And it feels like a hand is coming in from the sides gotcha. to, to encompass the characters. And I feel like the lighting works a lot better actually in the wider version of that piece. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have that available, but I, I ran into it. Uh, I did run into it online. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Very good. So that's uh, Keith Parkinson. And again, uh, Keith isn't with us anymore, but uh, you can see more of his work at uh, keithparkinson.com, which I believe is maintained. Now, we had, I had one, we got about... Um, okay, we have about one minute left. So if, if Paul was here, he'd be, he'd, be, he'd be goosing us to wrap it up, which I respect. And thank goodness he's there. Otherwise, our shows would go too long. I had one other piece queued up, which was the wizard in front of a planet. I don't know if you wanted. That's oh, a different yeah. artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's but... look at that. I mean, you know, um, it's, you know, we don't have to, uh, you know, we're finishing up with pieces that we right. like. Right, right. So, you know, so that you don't think that we're complete monsters. But but here's the thing. See the see this isn't in the eighties anymore. Oh, it's not. No. So this is so I th oh. it's, it's in that chapter. But I think what they've got in that chapter is here's the transition to what came later a little bit. I and see. so this is a piece by Fred Fields, and this is depicting the the super iconic uh, wizard Elminster from the Forgotten Realms, which is created by Ed Greenwood, and basically that character looks like Ed Greenwood. And he, this character always introduces all of the material narratively for mm. Forgotten Realms. And he's basically the, the representation of the Forgotten Realms. You can see here the piece got used on the cover of this novel by Ed. Shadows of Doom was also used as the cover to the Forgotten Realms box set at the time. And so this was 1993. So, so uh, we're kind of cheating. the good old 90s. We're cheating a little bit by, by stepping over the bounds into the 90s. But why... So you picked this out as something that you want to talk about. Why? How does this... Uh, how does this compare or contrast with the stuff that was in the 80s we looked at? Well, for me, you know, this was a, a, a nice change, you know, again, because the... You know, you, you kind of get away from this clean yeah. lines, clean background, you know. You get a sense that... You know, this is a painting, 
you know, that, uh, you know, maybe it's watercolor, you know, there's, there's like really nice textures that are completely yeah. abstract in the back, yeah. you know, so and, you know, not everything is explained. It's a nice mystery, you know. He's also not like, I mean, you know, his, his robe is clean, but the lines of his body are not like super clean, you know, it's a nice little action shot, you know, he kind of disappears into uh, the rocks at the bottom, right? you know, so... Um, you know, to me, that was a little bit more successful than, you know, those very, like, this is, this is your hero, this is what they look like, huh, they're posing like this, right. you know, um, you know, so it was, it was kind of like a nice visual change, you know, when I was looking through the, yeah, the, that, yeah. that whole chapter, which yeah. was like, oh, okay, something that actually looks a little bit different, and so now it's in the 90s, so that explains everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can see, this doesn't look super clean to me. His his robes don't look that pristine. No, they're not pristine. I feel like his beard might be dirty. Yeah. And he's got this, like, crackling, like, kind of Kirby-style, Kirby crackle around him that, like, looks either dangerous, or I'm not, is he coming out of a thing, or is right. he conjuring a thing? And right. And why is he, why is he standing in front of a, a, a planet somehow? And I'm, I'm kind of intrigued uh and and this feels a little bit more risky right than the, than the complete glamour shoddy stuff that's, that's right pristine and got their face front and center so you can right. recognize it quite so easily so. i mean you know the thing that's it's like if you're gonna do something about you know uh uh mysterious adventures you know you can't explain everything visually yeah. you know uh yeah. it has to have a certain amount of, of mystery in the yeah. artwork you know, and so this actually started to have a little bit of mystery. Yeah. Whereas, you know, before I was just like, okay, get it. You yeah. know, so. Yeah, I see that. So anyway. So I'm glad, I'm glad you picked that piece out too. I thought, I didn't, I didn't at yeah. the beginning with I didn't realize that was actually in the 90s. Mm. But it's, I think it's an interesting bookend of like to, to see where we came from and what was going to happen next right. more or less. Well, you know, if, uh, if we're not completely disinvited by our viewers... Yeah. Uh, because we basically disliked every single piece that we well, showed. Well, a lot of it. Uh, except for, right. you know, a couple. We liked Flame, right? We, we liked, liked Flame. Flame. And we liked the um, drawing. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I have a fond spot for Elmore's Red Dragon that was on the basic sure. set cover. Again, I poured over that as a jigsaw puzzle. And it ca it's, it's eye-catching. It's eye-catching. Yeah. It's been on many products. It's bright. It's bright, right? It gets, it gets your... It gets your attention. It gets your attention, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think in, in, in summary, I, like, like I, I basically agree with you, and I, I think that this has been helpful to find the language mm. that I've been struggling for for many years, is the artists were clearly you know, more technically skilled than the people who came before by kind of a long shot. Right. It's, it's much more technically proficient work, and yet it kind, of, it, it, it kind of emotionally kept me at arm's length. Right. Um, and, and I don't know. Was it was it just nostalgia? You see, I've been, you know, is it just nostalgia on my part? Was it, I got used to one thing and then I didn't like the new thing? Uh, one, you know, one thing that they, they point out in the Art and Arcana book is, you know, someone someone there says, you know, every edition has to remake its visual identity. If they're mm. going to sell product and they're going to make a name for themselves, they have to fundamentally, philosophically change their visual identity in a fairly big way i can see that so it's just it was just that i was used to the early, first edition stuff in the 70s and i couldn't get used to the new thing you know that some people well, some some people maybe. would argue that maybe maybe but you yeah. know uh, new doesn't necessarily mean that it's better hmm. you know um and and i think the stuff that comes later on that actually i like a lot yeah. better you know yeah. when i was flipping through the yeah. later chapters yeah right you know that i think you know artistically or like more right. appealing to me right um so right. you know, but then again, I don't have the emotional attachment to to the game right. that you do. Um, the 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 Art and Arcana book is a wonderful resource because yes. not many you know there are not many people are going to have products from every edition. Very few people are going to do that. Usually, you know, there's one edition that you love the most, mm -hmm. and you're familiar with that stuff. And so for that art book to be able to compare and contrast in one place is really a marvelous resource. And I'll say that later on. There's artwork that I did not expect to like as much as I did. And right. It was additions that I didn't play. Mm -hmm. um, and so if if we can get you back, and you and I are not both mutually banned from one from the from the channel in the future. Yeah, we'll um, see. We'll see what the reaction is uh, when uh, <laughs> when this airs. Hopefully, we can get you back for for volume three for the nights. Yeah. And I will say this: when I when I asked Isabel 
you know, what what we could do for another D&D art thing. Frankly, what Isabel said is, let's do the 90s, she said. Let's do the 90s because we're kids of the 90s. We are kids of the so, 90s. Um, Look at us. We're right? old people. We were young in the 90s. <laughs> so 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 maybe maybe next time when we when we do the 90s there'll be there'll be there'll be more joy coming coming on maybe of us. maybe yeah. um yeah we'll talk about eddie vetter or something and they and i'll you know and and they Lola were Palooza. you know in the 80s they were kind of constrained by this executive command to stay sure. stay away from the from the moral panic um and the the, the, the the glamour shoddy thing i think was kind of a kind of a, there was probably a lot of shackles on those artists yeah and yeah. if you look at their own websites, you will see a wider variety of work, and they're taking greater risks, and there's even more boobs. <laughs> oh, joy! If you're, just, just so you know, one just way or the other. Just if you're into that. Content warning or advertisement, however. <laughs> how, you can take that however you want. However you want. Yeah. So, um, great. So, thank you so much. You're for, so welcome. Your my my pleasure. Again. Hopefully, um, folks got something out of it, you know, and... Um, uh, and look up Kathy Colwitz, actually. Yeah. You know, see, you, you, yeah. you, you, you know, found out an artist that's not a D&D artist. I know. <laughs> you Philistines, go look up some, <laughs> go look up some art. Right. No, okay, well, okay, we are sharing, we're mutually sharing and learning on all sides of this. Is what's oh, right, 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 We're right. all sharing and <laughs> totally. learning and we are, we are more informed and, and can make better we're choices going be, forward. We're better people. This time right. I take that off. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, look for our uh, D&D, Art and D&D Volume 1 uh, from Season 1. Also look for the last time you were on Wandering DMs, the Eat, Plague, Love episode. Wonderful from episode. From Valentine's Day of this year. We had a lot of fun with that. We and did. And, of course, Isabel will be back for more Book of War uh, D&D Miniature Wargaming on Saturday nights. This um, time I will win! <laughs> <laughs> but maybe i mean maybe right it's, it's come a possibility on. come on right absolutely okay so with that thank you so much and you're welcome uh, we hope that we can get you back again sometime oh absolutely awesome okay <laughs> goodbye great that about wraps that up and we hope that you enjoyed uh, that very special uh, episode with isabella garbani on um, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with us about that, uh, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, uh, watching this on YouTube later on, please leave a comment and uh, tell us if we got something horribly wrong or if we got something horribly right um, or something in between. We would uh, enjoy hearing about that, of course. Um, uh, while you're there, uh, we have links to all the different sites we talked about in the show there are in the YouTube description links. Uh, links to Larry Elmore's site, Clyde Caldwell's, uh, Keith Parkinson's. Uh, there's the link to Isabel's own uh, art website and also the link to Art of D&D Volume 1 from Season 1 of uh, Wandering DM. So you can check all that out while you're there. Remember, of course, that you can, if you're maybe if you're new to the show, if, if I, I, I don't know who was subscriber number 1,000, but one of you is. Uh, so if you want to be subscriber number 1,001, uh, remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs. We are on YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and Facebook and GitHub. Uh, and we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. Also, uh, we do have audio podcast versions of all our shows uh, that become available usually maybe about a week after we do the live show. Um, and uh, that's on our website at wanderingdms.com as well as all of the top podcast providers. And while you're there, if you leave a comment or like it, uh, that very much helps us out. So please do that as well. Uh, we're off. Uh, our other shows are off for this upcoming week, actually. So um, uh, we will be back next Sunday and Paul will be back for another live episode. Maybe if you're looking for something on the Wandering DMs channel this week, you can check out, again, Art of D&D Part 1. If you haven't had an opportunity to see that, now I will say the quality is a lot different because it was, it was kind of in the dark ages of the Wandering DMs channel, so there's a rather distinct difference in uh, quality. But we're continuing to improve that with the generous help of our patrons. And if you're in a position to join our generous patrons, we do hope that you'll go to Patreon.com/WanderingDMs and pick out a tier that um, you are comfortable with and uh, support the show for special events like this and all of our really great D&D creator uh, guests that we have booked in upcoming months. We could not do that kind of thing without your generous help. 
and you'll see the benefits of our patron, including access to our private Discord server that just has wonderful informative chats going on all the time, 24 seven. There's monthly behind the scenes videos, special for our patrons. There's polls and surveys on upcoming topics or things you'd like to see. Just last night on the Book of War game, we had our patrons pick of the month and one of our guests, um, a seeker in particular, Julian, picked out an army for Isabel. And again, you just you just saw me being pretty skeptical that she could conceivably conceivably beat me. And um, we anyway, we had a great show. It's pretty hard to beat me, but we had a wonderful show. So maybe you should go see Book of War season two, episode ten that we we did la live last night. As a matter of fact, uh, really great episode for that. Uh, also on our Patreon, there's discounts on merch. And also after party chat, right after every show Sunday, we go and we jump on to the uh, live video on Discord and we continue the conversation um, uh, with, with kind of a smaller group if you're, if you're willing to join us. We always have a good time there. Um, I will also say, of course, we're live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Next week, uh, next Sunday, we are um, fortunate to have Mr. James Malajewski as our guest. Of course, the author of the old school Grognardia website. And wow, he's writing so much these days. Uh, that's June 6th uh, uh, next week. And we're planning on chatting about sci-fi themes in your fantasy campaigns. And of course, James is a huge expert in Tecumel. Um, Empire of the Petal Throne. He still runs a campaign. He uh, publishes a fanzine. I think not, but not just one of our viewers actually plays with James on a regular basis. So we are really looking forward to a discussion of James about the pros and cons of uh, having science fiction themes in your fantasy campaigns that he's done for a long time. So look for James Malashevsky one week from today when uh, Paul is back with us for a great conversation. Um, so yeah, so don't forget, uh, we are live every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and we do hope that you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. See you later.